Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to one more episode of True ML Talks. And today we have Sumit Singh, who is a distinguished uh, machine learning scientist at uh, at Turnitin. And um, again, like you know, I am Nikunj Bajaj, co-founder and CEO at True Foundry. And um, one thing that I want to share before we get started about today's episode is um, uh, Sumit actually comes from uh, a research background as well. And like you know, today we will. Uh, be able to like you know dive deeper into more theoretical and fundamental concepts around large language models as well, which is a uh, little bit different than what you have seen so far in a bunch of other TrueML talks that we have released in the past. So I'm super excited about this episode. And uh, uh, with that, uh, Sumit, I would love for you to introduce yourself um, uh, to to our listeners. Hi, um, thank you for having me on, Nikunj. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Sumit Singh. Um, at this time, I am Distinguished ML Scientist at Turnitin. Um, I started long, long back this journey. So I have a combined engineering and research and applied research background. But in general, I've always been involved in um, working on strategic and innovative projects. Uh, so so yeah, and I'll, I'll explain what that means. So I started, you know, after my graduation from the Indian Institute of Science, IISC, in 95. So it's been quite some quite a while uh, in system science and automation. So the automation part there actually stands for AI. In those days, um, you know, they just called it automation. So we had, um, you know, classical AI, we had neural networks, we had robotics, and my uh, thesis was in um, computational neuroscience. So, um, so I spent initially some time at IBM India, uh, which was known as Tata IBM at that time, doing graphics, and then um, computer vision face recognition at um, a lab inside uh, the National University of Singapore. So this this was the late 90s when uh, this it's called the winter of AI. So at that time, I kind of moved over to the dark side, which is basically um, engineering, software engineering, and I moved to the Bay Area. So since then, um, I worked for about uh, you know, eight years in a very pioneering company called OpenWave, uh, where we actually, the company pioneered uh, mobile internet. And, you know, people don't remember it now because, you know, the company kind of imploded after some point. But they, at one point, uh, we had about half of the world's mobile traffic going through our proxies. And so it was extremely in interesting, you know, understanding how the internet works and being part of that. And that's like one of the foundational companies where I kind of honed my uh, my skills as in soft in computer science and software engineering. Uh, then from that point on, I have moved into um, like data data area and uh, big data. And then I kind of came back to AI uh, in the security space. Uh, that's when I started deep learning because there was a, a lot of resurgence and you know deep learning was actually my first love so i wanted to return back to it so i i went back to that in at semantic and um from that point and then i basically um in order to get like deeper into into the space i solved a open ai's um research, research request challenge uh, in the first list they had at that time so that it was for math recognition and so i solved that and then um, so that was the sort of uh, state of art, you know, work that I published. And then later, um, I have been uh, at Turnitin. I mean, through yeah, it's it's a long journey. At Turnitin, I, I have developed a um, state of art, full page handwriting recognition model. And since that point on, I've been working on NLU and NLP, so mostly on digital text as opposed to vision. And that's um, so that's and I and I work on various. Uh, various projects, various uh, products within the company, all in the deep learning space. Wow. Um, such a remarkable introduction. Thank you so much, Sumit. And uh, like, you know, basically you've done it all, like from machine learning to software engineering, to big data, to deep learning, to large language models, I guess. Yeah, and it's been very interesting. It's all computer science, right? Yeah. So um, the field has evolved and I have evolved along with that. And it's been it's been a lot of fun. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, cool. So, uh, so Sumit, uh, with that, like you know, I would love to love to jump into some of the, I guess, technical deep dive that I'm super excited about today. 
and uh, one of the things that i that like you know of course you're recently like you know working on this paper um that i'm ex- super excited about like analyzing transformer dynamics as movement through embedding space so essentially you are talking about how you really think about transformer like the way transformers work under the hood basically right like what what's your mental model about transformers and uh, i would love to do deep dive into this paper like you know spend a few minutes so like you know maybe like you know we can think of a mental model like you are talking through this paper to like a class of students and i might be like one of the curious students in your class who's asking a bunch of questions but realistically you're explaining about your mental model to uh, to this class right um so i would love for you to introduce um how did you come up with this mental model why did you come up with this mental model what's the problem that you were trying to solve so like some context around why you wrote this paper and then like you know maybe explaining your mental model to begin with yeah that that's a wonderful framing and uh, i'm glad you asked so yeah so um a, a very good question about why i started uh, you know this work uh so <clears throat> at at turnitin there was a point that um i developed a um auto grading model for short answers uh, what that means is that you have um answers which are written by students and those are short so you know maybe like a paragraph two paragraphs something like that and um uh, you know in assignments or in tests or exams and then they get submitted so as part of the product we uh, you know we we build tools to to help the instructors to grade uh, assignments so this was a a model that i had built back in 21 and it used um uh, you know a few short the few short learning paradigm and i had trained a t5 model and it worked actually better than 80% accuracy and and on you know a variety of stem subjects and on a variety of different levels so chemistry mathematics physics um economics you know different subjects at different levels and it worked better than 80% accuracy and this was a, not a very large model it was like a um, 700 million parameter model it was a t5 large and so i just didn't know why it works and uh, cuz uh, you know grading is not easy so even though this was a few short problem but taking all you know all different kinds of subjects and just throwing it at it and it worked so <clears throat> so that's the reason i started and um you know initially i started looking at the weights and activations and um i i tried to find these tools so there is like a a language eva- um, language evaluation tool from from google and there's another one uh, of vision uh, of uh, vision models uh, visualization tool so I, i looked at various tools and did a lot of um attribution analysis like shape analysis and there are so many different ways to uh, analyze um why uh, why the model gives an output that it does and you know none of that yielded anything so uh, or didn't yield uh, answers in the way that i would have expected them and the biggest surprise to me was that even when i did like attention attribution meaning that when it produces an output what are the parts of the input that is attending on to that just came out blank I mean basically it was almost like a very random uniform kind of distribution on the different kinds of words Hmm. so as opposed to the work i had done previously um where i had built a math recognition model based on lstms but my own attention network so a separate attention network separate lstm and separate cnn that one was the attention patterns were so good uh, it was just transcribing like math text into latex okay so there the attention patterns were so good that every latex symbol that it was actually producing you could look at the attention pattern and it would exactly fall on that piece of image which it was you know transcribing wow. this didn't happen with this transformers and didn't definitely not happen with a uh, few shot so ultimately i ended up building my own visualization tool and um you know started tinkering at weights finally what happened was i realized that all this attention map business attention attribution and trying to interpret weights was not not helping so one day actually the whole thing clicked in my mind and um basically what i figured out was that this entire transformer is and all the layers of the transformer are just operators in the embedding space so what goes in is embedding what comes out of the layer is another embedding and that's what happens through the layers so <clears throat> 
And so if you imagine the embedding space, you can, you can imagine a three-dimensional space. And so what happens is that um, the sequence that gets predicted is a path through this embedding space. And ultimately what I realized and what I've shown in the paper through theoretical analysis is that um, you can imagine hills and valleys and like gorges and canyons inside, you know, in, in this landscape. And the transformer will follow the paths which are least entropy. So you can it, almost think of it as, it as if it's a river. And what's a river gonna do? It's gonna flow downstream and it's going to go into the valleys. It's not gonna go up in the hills. So um, with, and this embedding space gets set up in this way. And after you've trained the model and uh, assuming you have a fixed, um, well, it doesn't matter if it's fixed, but you have a decoding procedure. So given, actually keep the decoding procedure aside right now, but after the model is trained, the embedding space is fixed. And if you give it the same sequence, it's going to come up with exactly the same uh, embeddings. That's not going to change. Okay. So now imagine that you want to predict the next token. So for the next token, what we do is that you have a sequence that you give to the decoder. And what comes out is one single embedding vector that has aggregated this entire sequence of token vectors. So you have a, a sequence of token vectors, which gets aggregated into one single embedding vector. And that embedding vector now gets compared with all the token embeddings and that's, and then you get soft and you soft max that. So, but basically once you're comparing, so what you're doing is that the token vectors, which are very close to this, um, this aggregated embedding vector, those are the ones that are going to get maximum probability because they are like really close. Uh, so yeah, the other thing I found out was that um, the embedding space organizes in a ball. So it's not like an unbounded infinite, um, uh, magnitude vectors. The vectors, the vector um, magnitudes are all bounded, and it, it's different for different um, models. But basically, it's the um, the reason is that the layer norm, the layer norm functions, they reign in the size of the embedding vectors. So in the T5 small and T5 large models that I have um, specifically draw, uh, like visualized the embedding space. It all becomes it becomes a ball. It's almost round. It's not completely round, but and I've shown that in the paper. So so what 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 it means is that the proximity angular proximity plays a big role in um, in the in the dot product. So imagine if if the vectors are all unit length, then when you do a dot product, that's like doing cosine similarity. So so the, so the vectors, the token vectors that are close. Near nearby this aggregated vector, they get high probability, and the rest gets get low probability. So, so now when you predict the next token, um, if you have a greedy, let's say you have greedy decoding, then you'll predict, then you'll get the token with the maximum probability, and after that, again the token with the maximum probability. So this actually traces a path. So hmm. if you're doing greedy decoding, your path. And every time you give it one sequence, it'll predict the exact same sequence. When you're doing stochastic um, decoding, then at every step, you have options of uh, because you're sampling the token, right. the next token. So you have options. And in this case, there is a rare chance that you might end up with um, sampling a token that's like on a hill, hmm. as opposed to a token that's in a valley or it's like in, in a deep gorge. Right. So, but in general, the tendency, even with stochastic, so if, let's say you do top P uh, decoding, top P sampling, where you set top P equals 0.9. So that's then only going, to you, so your choice is going to be narrowed to only the high probability tokens. So that's equivalent of saying that only the valleys and the gorges, only those are the ones you will select in. But regardless of which one you select, all these paths, you can think of them as forks, but mm. all the paths are laid out. They are fixed. Right. So it's like tributaries of a river. They are all laid out, and the sampling is going to choose one of them. Mm. But once the model is trained, all the tributaries are laid out. So they are fixed. So this is the fact, right, for transformers. 
Now, LSTMs is similar and um, actually any sequence model that has a residual stream of, um, of embeddings, uh, which has a residual stream and, and has embeddings or, or you know, latent vectors, which basically is any, so basically any sequence model, they are all um, following the same basic idea. So that's one. The second, you know, the second thing that popped out was that normally in neural networks, what you think is that the lower layers are working at a lower layer, lower level of abstraction. Right. And as you go up, they are they start working at higher layer level of abstraction. But that's not the case with transformers because your emb token embeddings, which are the first layer, like layer zero, are at the same level of abstraction as the last layer, which is also an embedding vector. And in fact, um, what happens is in in many of the language models, the input embedding matrix and the output embedding matrix are the same. So the LM head, the language modeling head at the top is usually tied to the token embedding matrix of the input. Mm. So that is another like very compelling, compelling like evidence that shows you that uh, the, the level of, of abstraction is the same because you start with an embedding matrix and then at the top layer, the language modeling head is just a transpose of the embedding matrix. Mm. So the output vector, you are act when you do a you know matrix product with uh, the LM head, you're actually doing a dot product with all the token vectors, the same token vectors that are there in the in input embedding matrix. So, so yeah, and there are many other papers that uh, follow the same kind of uh, you know principle that embeddings. Uh, that the transformer works inside embeddings. Uh, so the induction head heads paper that came out from Anthropic one or two years back uh, that also talks about this resi residual stream and they also um, you know imply and that uh, the transformer is working on the same level of attraction throughout. Even though they don't say it explicitly, but it's basically implicit in their paper. So 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 you know unlike CNNs. Um, it became clear that, oh, this whole thing is actually working at the same level of abstraction. So then from that point on, I started to figure out how does this, um, how does this final aggregated vector come about? So starting with the sequence of token vectors, we end up with one vector for, so let's say the token vectors are, um, let's say V1 or W1 to WT, okay? Then if you follow the path of WT all the way up, then what comes out is going to be, the prediction is going to be WT plus one, right? Hmm, correct. So, so the aggregated vector, let's call it um, e, of, e, t, t plus, e, e of T, right? E subscript T. Hmm. So how do we go from the sequence W1 through WT to one single vector E subscript T? So that again uh, ends up being another kind of walk that I am calling the encoding walk in uh, in the embedding space. Mm. So the decoding, I call that the decoding walk, and which is stochastic. Uh, mm. Whereas the and that's non marco it's a non Markovian random walk. Whereas the encoding walk is a deterministic walk through embedding space. And at every step, what it is doing is that it is so the, the let's say the the vector w t. Uh, once you go up one layer, what, and you and you open up the the attention layer. What it's doing is it's looking at the all the vectors, W1 through WT, and it is forming a soft cluster based on how similar all these vectors are to itself. Hmm. And the notion of similarity is skewed by the linear transform vectors inside the attention uh, head. So you have WV and WO vectors. Which actually and WQ and WK and so so, uh, so Sumit before before we go deeper into this this part of understanding maybe I'll ask you a couple of follow up questions just to make sure that everyone who's listening is following along and uh, like you know we can build from that if that's okay yeah um, so Sumit like um, the first thing is like you know just fundamentally defining our embedding space that we're talking about right so like we are essentially uh, modeling the uh, the language model is like you know a walk in this embedding space and the reason we are able to think of it as a single embedding space is because um 
like i guess i guess this is where i, I want to ask you a question like the single embedding space that we're talking about is this the final encoded embedding that we that like you know we get out of like you know the, the entire context vector or because you're saying that flex all the way from input to the output like you're looking at similar embeddings and that entire thing can be considered the space like what's the uh, what are you defining as your embedding space i guess yeah so embedding space is um, the space uh, the vector space of size d model d underscore model hmm. and that d underscore model being the hidden size of the transformer okay and so you know it will be 512 or in the case of gpt it's like 12000 and uh, uh, you know that's the size so and every vector that comes out of every layer hmm. belongs to this embedding space so including the input the input token vectors so when you take a token and then you pass it through the embedding matrix and you get like a vector out right when you embed the tokens that vector which is the input yeah as well as a, if you take this input and just go up by the same position, just keep going up the stack. Yeah. So every vector that comes out of every layer, each and every one of them, all the way to the top, the context vector that you get finally. Right. They can they are viewed as being inside this embedding space. I see. Okay, got it. So it is not the number of parameters in the model. No, no. It is just the model, the underscore model. Okay, underscore. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. And it is also not like you know the the top layer, which is like the top representation. It's like all the hidden layers, basically. Yeah. Yes. Understood. Um, that makes sense. And then you also mentioned something very interesting, which is like you know a question that like you know a lot of people have on mind, um, uh, including me, which is, you know how and especially you you also come from vision background, so like you know you you probably understand this very deeply. Uh, that is. In CNN, it's a very clear model that lower level of ups, like lower levels in the uh, neural network, kind of models like the edges and like you know you keep building higher level features as you go ahead in the in the network, right? And you described very clearly that that is not the case with with transformer based models, basically, right? Um, and you gave a reasoning around like you know how your embedding remains similar from the lower levels to the higher levels but like i would love to understand this a bit deeper like you know what's and and also is there um is there something that you think this like you know layer by layer embedding kind of represents basically is there some some mental model that we can build around that would love to understand right, that right. yeah okay cool um so i think you asked about two things one is that why do I say that every layer is operating in the same abstract space yeah. as opposed to operating in different layers of abstraction, right? Right, yeah. So the so there are, so one is the residual stream. So as you know that inside the layers, so if you take the decoder, okay, let's take the encoder layer, that there is an input and then there is a tension layer and then you, there is this residual layer that actually residual link that directly adds the output of the attention layer to the input okay mm. and then you have the feed forward layer yeah where there's layer there might be layer norm or not but basically you have one linear transform then you have the relu activation and then you have another transform linear transform and then again there is a shortcut um, um to uh, where you where the inputs and outputs get added so First is this, that for this addition to be, um, to make any sense, they have to have the, the dimensions have to have the same meaning because you keep adding across the, across layers. So that's like the first thing. Okay. Um, second is if you take the encoder decoder models like T5. Yeah. Then you are taking the output of the encoder and you are through cross attention, you are adding it to every layer of the decoder. Right. So again, for this to be coherent, so you take two vectors and if they are coming at completely different levels of abstraction, then how can you add them? Right. Hmm. So that's like another thing. Then, um, the, then the final thing is that your um, the language modeling head and maybe this requires a little bit of explanation 
So language modeling head is basically a matrix, the size of which is D model by V. And V is basically the size of your embeddings, the, the number of embeddings you have, the token embedding. So it'll be like 52,000 or 32,000, something like that, based on um, how you tokenized. So it's so that's a matrix. And what you do is you take the, um, the context vector that comes out of the final layer of the decoder and you multiply it with this matrix. And what yeah. you get is you get 52,000 numbers, which you pass through a softmax. And right. uh, then what comes out is the probability of the token, the, the 52,000 tokens. So it's a distribution over the 52,000 tokens. Hmm. So if you look at the vector and matrix multiplication, you will see that this context vector actually gets dot product with um, the columns of this um, unembedding matrix. So the uh, language modeling head is also called unembedding, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And um, in a lot of models, this matrix is just a transpose of the embedding matrix, which means that the columns are just right. the token vectors. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now what you've done is you've taken the context vector and you're actually doing a dot product with the token vectors. Right. Now dot product is the similarity metric right. in the transformer. It's also used inside the attention layers. Hmm. It's, a, it's a similarity metric. So what you actually did was you took the context vector and you're finding the similar tokens. Hmm. And you're using the same token vectors in the final output layer that you use in the input layer. Hmm. So for this comparison, and for this comparison to again make sense, they have to be in the same embedding space. You can't take a vector from one embedding space and then compare it with token vectors of another embedding space. That doesn't make any sense. Hmm. I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. So, and then I guess in that in that frame of mind, I think that makes a ton of sense. Like you know, you have the context vector. You are taking dot product with the token vectors, and like you know, like whichever gives kind of the highest probability is kind of your next token essentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah, whichever um, is the nearest. Right. And that is your walk, basically. So like like you, so your starting point of your walk becomes whatever was your initial, I guess, the input or the context that you got. And then you're saying that adding more tokens to it is like essentially the next step in the walk and the next step in the walk. And that is right. what you're saying, that it's kind of like a river flowing, basically. Yeah. And one thing to remember here is that, so let's uh, unpack this um the the comparison with the token vectors in the in the language modeling head or the unembedding matrix. Let's unpack that. So hmm. when we say we are doing dot product, uh, if you momentarily just assume that all the vectors have the same length, so let's say they are on the unit circle or the unit sphere. Sure. Then in that case, it's cosine similarity, and what's going to happen is that the closer in angle a token vector is to the context vector, that much higher probability it's going to get. Absolutely, and yes. So yeah. what you're basically saying is that give me the nearest tokens. Correct, yeah. yeah in yeah. the embedding space. Hmm. So, right. right? And how, if, if a token is far, it gets less probability. If it is close, it gets more probability. So you was basically are saying that I have taken this sequence and I have converted that into a vector such that I want the closest, the, such that the closest token to this vector is my prediction. Hmm. Okay. Right, right, right. So, right. This is, so this is a function that takes W1 through WT and maps it into the neighborhood of WT plus one. That is right, yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. So what you're taking, you're taking this sequence and you are, transforming it into the neighborhood of WT plus one. Hmm. So that's where the magic happens. Right. How do you take a sequence and map it into the neighborhood of your WT plus one? Okay. Hmm. And so if you want to create an intelligent machine, this intelligent machine should take the sequence and it should map it into the neighborhood of WT plus one such that the sequence W1 through WT plus one appears intelligent. And so with WT plus two, WT plus three, 
And this whole path, when a human looks at it, they will say, oh my God, this is so intelligent. It's intelligent behavior. Hmm. And so what I've done is, so this mechanics, basically just the path, when a human looks at it, they evaluate it either as being stupid or as being intelligent. Hmm. And the more subtle patterns that the path can exhibit, that much more intelligent we are. So when we say in-context learning, few short learning, these are just paths. And inside the transformer, again, if you open the hood, if you look at the mechanics inside it, so what I've shown through analysis, that there is no pattern recognition. There is no, There are no kernels like a CNN where you can actually do pattern recognition. Hmm. So um, that, 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 that machinery doesn't exist. So in a CNN, you can say that maybe, you know, if you want to recognize dogs and cats, it's actually going to start to learn to, to uh, it's actually going to start to have kernels which resemble the nose of a dog, for example, or like, you know, the whiskers of a cat or something like that. Yeah, and then true. these all these signals kind of get aggregated and then it predicts whether it's a cat or not. But here, that mechanism is not there. And the closest thing that I found to a kernel is actually the, um, the position, uh, the relative position encodings. So the relative position encodings inside the uh, um, attention layer. Hmm. So they, um, in my theory, they perform, so, so they are static, they are fixed. They don't change according to data. And the only thing they do is they skew the, the aggregation weights mm. that mm. come out of the, the softmax uh, inside mm. that layer. And again, this skew is static. So one position encoding, if you look at the kernel and they're in the paper, it'll, it'll, it'll prefer um, positions which are really far. And the positions that are near uh, will be like negatively biased and the position that are far will be positively biased. So there are those kinds of, um, and, and surprisingly, there are more of those kind in the encoder than in the decoder. So this is something surprising. And um, so this is, um, so, so these position bias kernels, uh, they are not like the CNN kernels, but the only thing they do is they, they serve to um, counter the self bias. So, um, so they provide negative self bias. So when I say self bias, what it means is like, when you're going, let's say WT, when you're going from input all the way to up, and in, in, uh, if you didn't have any position bias, then this vector would, is likely to attract other vectors which are similar to itself, and it's going to attract itself the most. So okay. what you're going to end up is that uh, the final context vector is just going to be the same vector, maybe a little bit changed, but the same vector. So you'll end up predicting the same token over and over and over. Hmm. And I've seen those degenerate cases with LLMs. Uh, some of them, sometimes they just generate the same sentence over and over and over. That is right, yeah. Or they generate the same token, actually. Sometimes you get a why, 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 like all the way, and then you don't know why, you can't break out of it. That's so right. so this negative self-bias, this position encoding, is what, um, in many heads, it will actually suppress it, its own position, and it will enhance other positions. So it's it's very interesting to actually see the shapes of the position kernels, and I have those in the paper. Phenomenal! This is uh, such an interesting formulation, and like it's raising like you no know, more questions in my head because I almost feel like I see this type of behavior. Uh, I don't know if there is a theoretical reasoning behind it, but at least empirically, I've noticed this behavior of repeating like tokens and words more with smaller models. Right. Uh, right. Yes. And like, you know, uh, like, you know, larger models get better and better at not doing this stuff. So uh, can you help me understand, like, what what is it about large models that like you know, they don't fall into this trap of repeating the same thing versus the smaller models? Yeah. So I actually, uh, I mean, don't have a, you know, principled answer. Huh. Um, but in general, so I think so it could be the same reason why larger models are more um, intelligent than the smaller models. And I think it's got to do with the richness of the embedding space. Mm. And so that makes the feature space more granular uh, because as you go to larger models, the embedding size gets larger. Right. 
And the other thing that gets bigger is the number of layers and um, also the number of parameters inside, uh, specifically the um, inner dimension of the feed forward layer. So, so the feed forward, the first feed forward, so inside the feed forward layers, the first um, matrix actually it up um, it upscales the vector. Mm -hmm. So you know if your dimension is thousand, it'll take it up to four thousand or something. And then you have the ReLU, and then it brings it back down to thousand or whatever the D model might be. So more granular processing because you have um, more parameters inside and a larger dimensional uh, embedding space. I so see. these two things, I think, um, together make the model more intelligent and therefore um, they make it less uh, prone to repetition. And then um, it's, it also depends on your decoding scheme. So if you are using greedy decoding or beam search, you are more likely to get this problem than if you are just sampling. So top yeah. P sampling or top K sampling, yes. then you'll get less of this. But you know, one interesting thing I observed is that sometimes the sentences are repeated. That is so true. Yes, that, that as well. Yes, yeah. So that actually brings us to concept space. Huh. And you know, so just remember this: when we talk about concept space, if we do, then then I'll refer back to this uh, this example. Got it. Okay, this is very interesting. And actually, one other thing that, like you know, the way you formulated this entire thing, is it fair to say that in context learning is almost a misnomer at this point because yes, 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 there's yes. no learning happening in in-context learning at this point. Completely. That's completely. So there is no learning happening. I mean, because the embedding space is fixed. The yeah. entire, all the paths are fixed. Yeah. All you're doing is picking, choosing. Right. So what learning here? Your your weights are not changing. Nothing. I mean, the so yeah. And, um, you know, there is this argument or debate that's going on that, um, you know, are these models really intelligent? Can they really reason? And uh, just today, actually, I saw a tweet by, you know, Subarao Kambampati and then Jan Lakun chiming in uh, and essentially saying that, you know, these models don't have the mechanism to do any kind of principal reasoning in the way that we, we think we do. And um, so they're just um, getting, uh, you know, predicting tokens from memory. And that's basically essentially what I'm saying, which is that all these paths are predetermined. And that's like the memory of the model, you could say. And it's just working on those. So, but one thing to remember is that it hasn't, all your prediction data, or predictions are not in the training data set. So to call it, I wouldn't call it memory because memory implies that you have actually seen all these paths before, but mm -hmm. that's not the case. What you have done is you have taken all the training data, all the paths from the training data, and you have compressed those into this actually very small embedding space, so thousand embeddings, but still it's compressed. Excuse me, it's compression, and you have represented those paths in this embedding space and in your transformer embedding function. So transformer is an embedding function, right? And so the combination of the embedding function and the embedding space together. Um, uh, that's what maps the training data, but it extrapolates, actually it interpolates um, uh, into unseen paths, which have not yet been walked, but you know they are ready for walking on. But these are not, the, these paths were not part of the training data set. So you know to say that its memory is probably not that accurate. Got it. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It makes sense. So like you could, you could almost say that like, you know, an in-context learning is essentially like, you know, one execution, like one path, essentially, like, you know, with a different starting point, the context becomes a different yes, yes. starting point. Completely, completely right. And the path may not have been walked on before. Yes. That's the other thing to remember. Right. Because the context is different, essentially. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if it's, if the sequence, if the context sequence is your training data set, then you could say that the path has been walked before, uh, maybe depending on what how the predictions come out. But yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, and in the, in this paradigm, how would you describe um, how would you describe uh, few shot learning and uh, fine tuning? So yeah, so in context learning and few shot learning is the same thing, um, as far as I'm concerned. That makes sense. Yes, in context. Yes, that, that I I can see how how so, that works. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, in, I mean, either you have like a chat history or you have many times you actually do give examples inside the chat history also. So, yeah, yeah. so that's all like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a sequence. It's just a context. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. Now, fine tuning. Um, also, basically, fine tuning is just changing the paths in the in the embedding space. So you're giving it more data. And maybe you're referring to RLHF. Or are you just talking about like just regular fine tuning supervised? No, actually, actually, I was just talking about supervised fine tuning, and you're right. Like, no, it's 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 just like so. Like, essentially, what you're training is the like you know, what you're describing is the following: that training a transformer based model is essentially creating this this entire like whatever just map or the geography of like you know these undulations and stuff like that. Correct. And fine tuning, you're just changing that, that map in some way, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and the difference between how they do RLHF and and supervised fine tuning. So supervised fine tuning will be using cross entropy loss. RLHF will be using the signal that comes from um, from the uh, you know from the uh, reinforced from the model from the evaluation model. But there the the difference is how you propagate the signal. So in the case of cross entropy, you're doing it token by token, whereas in the case of RLHF, you're propagating the same signal back across the entire sequence and mm. so but ultimately you're still doing back propagation and you're still doing optimization using one of those optimizers uh, the only difference is that with rlhf that same you know positive or negative reinforcement it gets distributed across the and all the tokens of the sequence the same signal as opposed to the regular fine tuning but in both cases like you said you know correctly the undulations in in the map in the geography are just being changed and that's it right exactly yeah yeah and and how you change that is kind of getting affected with whether you're doing supervised fine tuning or rlhf but like the output is like a different map in some way yeah 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 understood there is uh, this is like such a deep topic i can keep going on and on but like you know at some point like i want to switch gears as well maybe i'll ask you one other question that like really caught my attention when i was reading through this is your mention about with some fundamental concepts here like some fundamental operations around like you know data independent filtering and data dependent aggregation like now this entire topic about transformer based models also shares like you know also kind of like you know unifies their visualization with like other sequence models or even like you know across modalities like and when you say right. across modalities i assume that you mean something like vision or speech or like you know different right. types of data sets beyond so beyond like just text generation um, it also goes to image. And that's where I think it, it's very interesting to me is because so far there is a nice temporal aspect to whatever we have been talking about that you have a context, you add more tokens and you keep moving forward in that walk. But like the moment I switch modalities, uh, especially I go to image, I kind of lose that sequence of like, you know, the, the, that, that frame of mind. So we'd love to understand that a bit more. Yeah. So see, <clears throat> ultimately, even with sequences, you can actually talk about uh, denoising. And so BERT kind of models, when they are trained, even T5 models. And actually, um, there are infilling models also, but those are, so never mind those. But right now, just let's just talk about BERT. <clears throat> mm. In the BERT um, uh, training procedure, you blank out 15% of the tokens randomly. Mm. And you try to predict those. Sure. Okay. So you are training the transformer to infill. Sure. Right? Yeah. Hmm. So in this case, also, what you're doing is doesn't matter if this blank token is at the end or hmm. whether it is in the middle. That's right. Ultimately, yeah. you have a context, right? If the blank token is in the end, that then all the context is on the left side. But if the blank right. token is in the middle, that you have some context on the left side, some on the right side. And what you will do is you will take the left context and the right context, aggregate those into one single context vector. And this context vector context vector should now fall in the neighborhood of mm -hmm. your target token. Same thing. I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, interesting. So in some way, again, like you know, if I really had to think in terms of that map and like you know, something flowing, depending on what pixel is missing or what like the token number is missing. It is again setting a different context or a different starting point in some way. Yes. So, for example, in terms of word prediction, if you had like three words in the beginning, fourth word is blank, like four token is blank, and there's five words in the end, 
that combination is a different starting point from let's say two words in the beginning and four words in the end and there's like you know something in the middle that's that's there basically yeah that's yeah great. and and let me tell you that what i found with t5 models which is encoder and decoder is that the encoder behaves like this so in the encoder when you encode wt the context yeah. vector that comes out at the end it happens to be uh, in the neighborhood of wt it right. doesn't stray very far Hmm. And so this harkens back to word to vec and globe embeddings, uh, those different um, embedding uh, models that came out like in 2013, 2012, 2014, that time. So it harkens back to that. But basically, you're taking a context, you're creating an aggregated vector or context vector, which should be in the neighborhood of your target. Hmm. Now, same thing when you're infilling an image or when you're completing an image. And hmm. same thing when you are taking a context, which is text, and you are predicting a new image, like you are doing in the diffusion models. Right. Hmm. <clears throat> so right. if you go back to, let's say, 10 years back or something like that, um, there were a lot of, so there was like this fix, um, these these models, um, vision models, which would complete the um, you, you give it half an image and it'll complete it, hmm. or um, you blank out a portion of an image in the middle and it'll complete it. Hmm. And these were, these were all um, LSTM based, LSTM and in some cases uh, causal CNN based, but essentially doing the same thing. Hmm. Interesting. That makes sense. Again, I, I think I have a few more follow-up questions to that, but just in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll not ask you those follow-up questions and maybe I'll switch, switch gears a little bit and uh, talk a bit more from an application standpoint. So right now, like, you know, um, in terms of utilizing some of these models, um, I guess like, you know, one, one question for the transition is with this understanding, with this framework, are there like you know any practical differences that you have seen when you actually like you know put these models to use? So let's say I don't know if you decided to use uh, a GPT three point five or GPT four uh, versus let's say if you were using let's say a Llama two or a Falcon forty billion or whatever. Uh, is there like any specific difference in how you use these models based on like you know this this framework that you've created for yourself to think about? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think now I'm squarely in the camp of. Um the the people who are using these models as uh, general purpose intelligence machines and i am in the camp so earlier what i was thinking was i was trying to steer these models by changing the by by doing something in the embedding space so for example by injecting embeddings in the into different layers maybe try to steer it or uh, maybe try to output a less biased path, a less biased sequence by yeah. either adding or subtracting vectors at certain points, hmm. right? So <clears throat> now I think uh, I think of um, all the vectors at every level as being at the same you know level of abstraction. So I'm okay with just uh, doing prompt engineering because. Um, finally, it's the context that I'm giving it. It'll get converted into embedding vectors, so I'm I'm fine doing that. Uh, the second thing is that um, all the different variations in the models to me now that makes a little, uh, less difference because um, like when working for this paper, I have also researched um, attention-free models, and mm -hmm. um, as you pointed out, uh, this theory it unifies. LSTMs and transformers and attention-free models as well. So the differences between the specific models now are less important to me. And what's more important is basically all the paths that have been carved out in this embedding space, regardless of whether it's model A or model B. Hmm. So I think I'm, I'm taking now a more practical approach and a more kind of generic approach because now at least in my mind, I think I understand how all of these models work under the covers, the underlying dynamics. And therefore, um, the specific flavor of the model is less important to me. I'll just go with um, evaluation results 
on benchmarks and also on our data sets and um, if ne necessary, fine tune. Otherwise, um, just use the, the best model that evaluates the best and just use it for the task. Got it. Understood. Makes a ton of sense. Then maybe there's two other questions here. Um, one thing is, so so like if you are saying that like, you know, you're focusing more and more on prompt engineering, and then obviously you have your own data set on which you're working, so which I am assuming was not accessible to any of these models when they were pre-training. Uh, so the route to pass your own data would be as part of the context of so some sort of retrieval augmented generation or something. Right. That... Correct. Right. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. So sorry, sorry, what's the question here? So the question is that like basically like you are kind of the default mode of you using these large language models would basically become retrieval augmented generation in that case. That's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> and it depends on the use sometimes. So those are all the use cases that I'm seeing currently. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There could be some use cases where we might be forced to, um, to imbue the model with some additional knowledge. Right. Um, but right now, it seems like the general knowledge that's already inbuilt into the large language models Got is it. fine. Um, okay, there's one one area. So if we wanted to reduce the cost of the LLM, sure. and that's a very real concern. So let's say we build, initially we build a, a product with LLMs, and we try mm -hmm. it out. There's a good product market fit, and we are good with it. What's going to happen is it's very likely that either the margins are positive, uh, are like very small, or they're negative. Hmm. Uh, right. Because um, LLMs are expensive, especially when you start using them as engines um, in Langchain or whatever, you'll, there'll, there'll be loops and stuff like that. So in those cases, then we will want to train smaller models for specific tasks. And in those cases, so like, let's say go with 7 billion parameter, uh, you know, Lama instead of the 70 billion or, or OpenAI. So in those cases, uh, I do foresee that um, we will want to be uh, using our own, our own uh, to be fine tuning on our own specific tasks. Hmm. Got it. I see. I see. Well, that's mostly cost because of cost. Because of cost. I see. Understood. Got it. Plus, I think, uh, uh, like you know, with uh, uh, with OpenAI and all, I think like even the cost of serving the fine tuned models are, are also very expensive. So I assume like that can add up to like if it's a high traffic use case. Yeah. Um, I mean, their prices are very competitive, but um, if you have high traffic use case, then yes, it becomes. Uh, Got it. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, like, you know, for uh, for walking us through, like, you know, this very detailed deep dive mental model of like, you know, how you think about uh, LLMs. And to be honest, this is literally the first time um, I've at least put a framework in my head of how I how I could potentially think about how LLMs are reasoning, basically. I would probably go reread the paper that that like you know you have you have you have published so that like you know I, I probably understand this even better now. But uh, uh, but I think this this would take a few iterations. So I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot. I enjoyed the conversation too. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sumit. Yeah.